Tonight, hundreds of your favorite stars will be at the grandest opening in entertainment history. And you're invited. The Disney MGM Studios Theme Park Grand Opening. Tonight on a special presentation of the magical world of Disney. The grand opening of the Disney MGM Studios theme park. Join James Stewart, Smokey Robinson, Jane Fonda, John Forsythe, Stephanie Powers, Buster Poindexter, Kate Jackson, Dick Van Dyke, Ann Miller, Ashburton Simpson, Suzanne Summers, Kathy Lee Crosby, Tony Randall, Rue McClanahan, Estelle Getty, and more superstars and more famous cars. This is going to be great. The Disney MGM Studios theme park grand opening, a world premiere exclusive next on the magical world of Disney. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. In a great tradition of Hollywood, I'd like to welcome you to a major studio sneak preview. Tonight, the Disney MGM Studios theme park will officially open to the public. But as the final touches are being put on this wonderful new theme park, we're going to give you a glimpse of what all the excitement is about. We're also going to try and give you a sense of what this thing called Hollywood is all about. When we think of movies, we think of entertainment. But the greatest films have done much more than simply entertainment. They've enlightened us, inspired us, and helped shape the world in which we live. Each of us has a favorite movie, one that has stuck in our minds and influenced our lives. Mine was Pinocchio. I'll never forget the first time I saw it. It inspired in me a sense of awe and beauty and creative possibilities that have stayed with me all my life. Tonight, we're going to talk to some pretty remarkable people about the films that have affected them. I think you'll be fascinated with what they have to say. So sit back and enjoy this sneak preview of the Hollywood we created in Florida. There's not so much a theme park as a state of mind. A Hollywood that never was and will always be. Welcome to the grand opening of the newest, most fantastic attraction at Walt Disney World. The all-new Disney MGM Studios theme park. Starring in alphabetical order, Harry Anderson, Ashford and Simpson, George Burns, Joy, Monica, and Leanna Creel, Walter Cronkite, Jane Fonda, John Forsythe, Estelle Getty, George S. Irving, Kate Jackson, Rue McClanahan, Ann Miller, Eve Montan, Willie Nelson, Buster Poindexter, The Pointer Sisters, Stephanie Powers, Tony Randall, John Ritter, Smokey Robinson, Mickey Rooney, Suzanne Summers. James Stewart, Dick Van Dyke, and special appearances by Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and Lech Valencia. Faster, pageants 
That is the magic of movies. Hi, I'm John Ritter, and I've been sent down here by the Disney people as sort of a special emissary to see that everything's perfect and ready to go before the grand opening of these incredible studios. Can you believe this? I just left Hollywood, California, and here I am in Hollywood, but in Florida. Now, would you look at that? The Chinese theater. I just entered through the studio gates, and right over here, is the old Hollywood Brown Derby restaurant. All these landmarks that mean Hollywood to much of the world, all recreated here at the Disney MGM Studios theme park in Florida. What they have done is built movie studios that combine business and pleasure. The business of making movies and the pleasure of the public who can watch the movies and television shows as they're being made. To give you an idea of the size, let me put it into perspective. The studio tour and theme park area is 135 acres, making it one of the largest movie lots in America. And that 135 acres fits into Walt Disney World, which is twice the size of Manhattan. We're not talking theme park, we're talking theme country. There's a lot to do before the gala opening, but I think we can get it done. After all, we've got two full days. Uh, excuse now, me, Mr. Ritter. Yeah. I'm on my way to my post, and I overheard you say uh, something about the opening. 
it's not two days, it's less than two hours. Two hours, two days, you see, that doesn't phase me because as the great showman P.T. Barnum once said, less than two hours before the grand opening? I don't remember P.T. Barnum saying that. Less than two, it's less than, all right, everybody, we've got to move it, less than two hours. I can't, we can't move it. Oh, we have to move her on TV. Come on, move it! Harry Anderson's World of Special Effects, Kate Jackson, and a movie memory from Ronald Reagan when he returns. We now return to the grand opening celebration. Now, you see, I have to make sure that everything's working, so don't panic. We're going to meet the deadline and everything will be fantastic. Let's see, we've got the stuntmen, showgirls, seven piano playing monkeys on risers. Are they here? We're not sure about that, but I'm sure they'll be here. 100 redheads, I personally supervise that. 600 dancers. One Willie Nelson in performance, good. Thousands of fireworks, check. At least three singing and dancing Pointer Sisters. All right, a host of marching bands. One inimitable George Burns and streamers. Do we have this? We have the streamers. Tap dancers and trained flying birds, good, and much, much more. But uh, before all that happens, I've got to make sure that everything's ready. So why don't you... Um, Come along with me and check it out for yourself, okay? But uh, first, uh, just meet me back here in about a minute, all right? Don't go away. That's it, Miss Jackson. Thank you, Linda. You look lovely. Oh, thank you. Hello. I'm originally from Birmingham, Alabama, and I saw a lot of movies when I was growing up, but it wasn't until I was I, I, about 20 that I first saw Casablanca, and it really made an impression. It was a romance, of course, and, you know, being 20, I went right along with that. But there was more. See, I can still remember the first time I saw the scene at the airport at the end. You know, I had my handkerchief out just like everybody else. But when I left the theater, I took something else with me. It was the first time that I really thought about honor as a living experience. looking at you, kid. Hi. What you looking for? Oh, uh, excuse me. I think I left my Mickey Mouse Club jacket in here. Have you seen it? No. Maybe somebody took it back to the dressing room for you. Maybe it's over here. Uh, oh, great. You found it. Great. So tell me, are you a member of the all-new Mickey Mouse Club? I sure am. Our studio's right down the hall. Aha. Uh -huh. The Mickey Mouse Club is a Disney tradition that started many years ago. Who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? M-R-T-K-E-Y-M-O-U-R-T Over 25 million kids signed up for a half hour each afternoon after school, and now their kids are the charter members of the all-new Mickey Mouse Club.
is this? Nobody's working. We've got a deadline and, and nobody's working. Where is everybody? Come on, people. This is supposed to be called Catastrophe Canyon. I want to see some action. I want to hear some action. I want to feel some action. And now it's raining. This is not good. We're going to be rained out tonight. What is this? under the bee? Hi, I'm Harry Anderson, and this is my friend, the bee. He insisted on being here for the grand opening. I call him Bear. You see, they have this other bee that they call Square. I wasn't sure whether I should ride Be There or Be Square. This is a good demonstration of a beautiful special effect called Chroma Key. Wherever the camera sees blue, a whole new background can be substituted. And when it's all put together, the final result is movie magic. We're here in the special effects warehouse where they make and store all the special effects props. The mad scientists who work in this place must be out for a late lunch. Wonder what this thing does. Ah! Ah! Just kidding. What do we have here? Well, well, this must be what they call the Ronald Ray gun. And over here, look at this beauty. A perfect little model of the Dipmobile from the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. You know, this room is filled to the rafters with creatures and critters and creepy crawlers. Some made you laugh, some scared you to death. Wow! Place is going nuts! You know, all of these props were made for specific motion pictures. And if you weren't afraid to peek, you might have seen some of them. It's super califragilistic, expialidocious, even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. If you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Super califragilistic, expialidocious. <laughs> Of course I was afraid to speak when I was just a lad. My father gave me nails a tweet and told me I was bad. But then one day I learned a word to say we ain't can nose. The, the biggest, biggest word you ever heard, heard and this is how it goes. Oh, super kind of fragile, this is just beyond the ocean. Even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. If you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Super kind of fragile, this is just beyond the ocean. I'm the little underline, I'm the little underline, I'm the little underline. He'd use his word and all would say, there goes a clever gent. When Dukes and Martin Rogers pass a time of day with me, I say me special word and leave me off me off the tea. Woo! That last film certainly had a handsome leading man. Well, that's one kind of special effect. Here's another.
looks authentic, don't it? This is where those exciting naval battles, like the ones you saw in War and Remembrance, were actually fought. The South Pacific and the ships of the line, right here, in the studio back lot, in the big tank of water. That back there is a naval fireboat. You know, they've got this great gag with this tugboat and that wheelhouse. But uh, it's never been tried before, and I don't know where we would find a sucker stupid enough to get in there the first time. Harry! Harry, there's less than an hour to the grand opening party. Is everything here set? Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, well, there is one thing that hasn't been uh, checked out yet. What, what's that? The wheelhouse. The wheelhouse isn't ready? Somebody should check it out. Well, Come yeah, on. you know, John, you're right, but I don't know where we would find somebody at this hour. Okay, fine, I'll do it. Great, great, great. Here, put this on. Put this on? Yeah. Why do you uh, want me to put this because on? Because then you look like the little guy in the boat. Why would I want to look like the little guy in the boat? Because he's cute. He's cute? Yeah, and so are you. This looks very good on you. Oh, good. It well, does. I mean, it's kind of a bold fashion statement, but it works. Well, I like to look like a little guy in the boat, but <laughs> listen, I, I, I got to be finished in less than an hour because the party... Where's my watch? I'll oh. hold on to this till we're done, okay? Come on, this is going to be fun. Is this going to be fun? Yeah, and I know fun, John, and this is going to be fun. You go on in there. I should go in here? Let's get in there and hold on to the wheel, Harry, and then we'll have fun. It's very moist in here. Huh? It's very moist. Are you having fun yet? Well, it's, it's, uh, uh Harry? Yeah? This is not too steady in well, here. No, no, it's fine, John, really, it's fine. Well, I don't feel so fine. I feel a lot of cuisosity starting to come up. All right, now. By intercutting the model in the tank with a close-up of John in the wheelhouse, we give the special effect of John in a storm at sea, including a giant wave. A giant what? Wave! What a sap. I got a little moist in there. I think it needs some uh, adjustment. No, no, that's the way it's supposed to work. It was swell. But I'm soaked. Yeah, ain't you? Yeah. Well, wardrobe could dry you off. Right. Wardrobe. I know, John, you need this, don't you? Oh, yeah, thanks, pal. It's still ticking. Wardrobe, makeup, nurse. 1939 is generally thought of as a milestone year for films. That was the year that we saw Gone with the Wind, Stagecoach, Wuthering Heights, The Wizard of Oz, Goodbye Mr. Chips, Of Mice and Men, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. An unforgettable year for motion pictures. I saw all of those films and appreciated all of them, but one of them had a great impact on my life. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I began to realize through the power of that motion picture, that one man can make a difference. John Forsythe, Dick Van Dyke, and the Indiana Jones epic stunt spectacular when we return. The one that I recall the strongest is Teutonic Nights, the movie that told about the struggle of the Polish nation in those times. It reassured me that sometimes you won't succeed without a fight. One must fight. Let the present time change the form of the fight. In today's world, you can fight peacefully, and that's the sort of fight I'm in. I do not imagine myself or other people without film. The film explains history or how it presents the struggle. We take it all for granted. Most of you saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know that that was Harrison Ford battling that truck, not me. You don't know? 
Well, let's put it this way. You're right, it wasn't me, but you're wrong. It wasn't Harrison Ford either. It was his double, a stuntman. You know, there's something so familiar about your voice. Come on, Angel. Although Sir Harrison Ford does a lot of his own stunts in his pictures, usually when an actor has to do something really hazardous in the course of making a movie, these folks, the stuntmen, take over. You learn how to fall and not hurt yourself. You learn how to stop on a dime and not move. You learn how to wield a mean sword like those folks are doing. They've been rehearsing for some time for their part in this wonderful presentation of Daring Do. And boy, is the training tough. I tell you, ultimately, it's a breathtaking combination of athletic prowess, split-second timing, yeah. and rigorous rehearsal. John Case! Yeah. You gotta get a move on. This park is opening in less than two hours, so please, what? anything you can do, help me. Please, people! We've all gotta work together! Uh, my fault. Sorry, that was... Oh, God. Yes! We're fine. Just the... I've heard of working in the sticks. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dick Van Dyke. You know, one of the perks you get after being in this business for a little while is when the script calls for an attractive young star, I am given not one, not two, but three lovely ladies. They're the stars of Parent Trap 3. These are the Creole triplets. And I'm going to show the girls some of my favorite places around the park. But uh, first, let's find out which is which here. My name is Joy. Mine's Leanna. My name's Monica. Hi. I'm Dick Van Dyke. You can call me Mr. Van Dyke. <laughs> this place looks exactly like the Chinese theater in Hollywood. Even down to the footprints in the cement. I'd love to put my footprints in cement. You know, there's two ways to accomplish that. You can become a famous film star, or you can rat on Big Rui. <laughs> Let's see if our feet fit. Pee-wee Herman and I have the same size shoe. <laughs> You're lucky. Mine match King Kong's. Does anyone ever get stuck in this stuff? Uh, just him. <laughs> okay, girls, let's go. I want to show you around the park. This place is called the Looney Bin. This place is so cool. Look, Joy, this is the Tomb Patrol wagon from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Hey, you guys, come listen to this. <laughs> hey, wait, look, there's another one. <laughs> hey, listen to this. Girls, come here. This is my favorite box. You got to hear this. Okay, now listen. Uh, you know, I tried a spot remover once. Didn't take the stain out, but my dog disappeared. <laughs> you know, once there were two farmers. Now there's more. Now there's more. That does it. I'm through telling jokes. <laughs> Everybody's got to be a critic. <laughs> hey, look over here. Our next stop, the Monster Sound Show. Here's Liana dubbing her own voice for the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland. Oh, oh but you must. She'll, she'll be, be mad, mad about you. Simply, simply mad. mad. <laughs> but what I like best is horsing around, supplying all the hoofbeats for the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Joy and her sisters enjoy sharing the fun with some of sound effect wizard Jimmy McDonald's very bizarre contraptions. The Great Movie Ride is one of the highlights of the Disney MGM Studios theme park. 
visitors find themselves right in the middle of the action in such great films as Raiders of the Lost Ark, Alien, and The Wizard of Oz. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. You know, that movie ride was really great. I'm ready to go again. You know, that's the special thing about the movies. You can always go back again and relive all those wonderful memories. When you think about it, movies have a lot to do with the way we live. And what about the way we talk? Mm. And the way we dress? The way we walk. Wait, the way we walk? Mm. Uh, don't you think that's getting just a little carried away? I guess maybe you're right. Hey, why don't I treat you all to a soda at the Brown Derby? Okay. Ellie? <laughs> Good evening. I'm Mickey Rooney. Every once in a while, someone will ask me, what movie made the biggest impression on me? Without thinking twice about the question, I always say, love finds Andy Hardy. Yes, I was lucky enough to make 17 of those Andy Hardy series, but it was in 1938 that I made that special one with a certain young 16-year-old girl named Judy Garland. Judy had such a magnificent talent. There was a certain vulnerability about this wonderful girl that made you want to take care of her. Audiences fell in love with her, and so did I. That's why my memories are so fond of Love Finds Andy Hardy. Thank you. Tony Randall, Suzanne Summers, and a movie memory from Margaret Thatcher when we return. We now return to the grand opening celebration. I think the first film that really had a strong impact on me was Grapes of Wrath. I saw it when I was quite young. And before then, I think the only films that I'd ever seen were great big glamorous Hollywood adventures and romances. And suddenly here was this film that was so simple, so very real, and it was about poor people, the kind of people that if you were privileged and upper class like I was, you, uh, you didn't normally think about or pay any attention to. And on top of it, one of them was my father, and they were they were getting into such trouble and being beaten and killed just for asking to be treated fairly. And then at the end of the movie, in the famous speech to his mother, my father said to her, maybe a man ain't got a soul of his own. Maybe he's just got a piece of a big one. And it seemed to be saying that life should be about more than just me and that you can commit your life to to larger things, to larger values, and if people work together, they can attain those, those goals. That's, to me, what the movie represented, and certainly what my father represented. Welcome to Superstar Television. Superstar Television is a unique and oft-times hilarious attraction of the studio. Not only does it offer a delightful capsule history of TV, but in this theater, many of your favorite shows, from Gilligan's Island to Cheers, feature a very special guest star, you. Here's how it works. First, members of the audience are chosen to perform in the show. Yes, you. Come on up here. Let's give her a hand, ladies and gentlemen. Right up through those steps. Our fledgling actors are then hurried backstage for costumes and makeup. New York. Do you have any experience in television? I watch it. <laughs> Great. Then you're in the show. Come with me. Right this way. Today, on General Hospital. The engineering geniuses placed the newly chosen, now-costumed theme park guest into the existing footage of famous TV shows. Hello? This is Lucy Tom Jones. I told you before, Donald isn't here. Where is he? I have been trying to get him. I'll bet you have. <laughs> Look, Lucy, you stay away from my husband. Goodbye. <laughs> Bobby's television debut proved to be a dream come true. He got to work with Howard Cosell. Well, tell me, what would you prefer? An appearance on The Tonight Show or a guest spot with Howard Cosell? I'm a jock. I'll take Cosell. Great. And now, Howard Cosell Sports Break. The place, the big Shea, Shea Stadium. The championship resting on the bat of this player. The pitch, the swing, and it's out of here. A grand slam home run. The Mets win. Baseball fans will remember this one for a long, long time. 
And we have the individual voted most valuable player of this game. Now, how were you able to read that curve so accurately? Gee, Howard, I really don't know. I just close my eyes and swing. Modesty, honesty, too. And the science of hitting. Thank you, my friend, for being with us. Thanks, Howard. My pleasure. And that's this edition of Sports Break. I hope you can join us next time. Until then, Howard Cosell saying so long for now. Have you ever wanted to make Johnny Carson laugh? What was your least favorite picture that you did? And then maybe after you did it, said maybe I shouldn't have done it. Was there one? The worst movie I ever made was a musical. I was supposed to play an accordion. And as you know, Johnny, I'm no musician. They won't even let me sing in the shower. But they made me do it anyway, and it sounded so bad, people just got up and walked out on me. And these people were on an airplane. You can tell your grandchildren you once worked with Lucille Ball. <laughs> and a happy, surprise bunch of tour guest stars wave goodbye after their television debut. It was in the early days of the war. I was young. I went rarely to the cinema, but we all went to see Mrs. Miniver. It was a story of an English family in an English village at the beginning of the war, amid the bombs, amid the raids on the village. Greer Garson played the title role. I remember so very vividly the scene when aircraft came and machine gunned the village. And it was the daughter who lost her life. Oh, Carol. The village. Oh. Oh, we must get back there. They need help. Carol. Carol, what is mm. it? America hadn't then come into the war. It was something that America at that time did for us. It lifted our morale. And it had a tremendous effect in America. And I shall never forget it. Wardrobe. In real life, you go to the mall. When you're making a movie, the mall comes to you. <laughs> this is just another part of the magic. Oh, when I was a kid, I thought the movie musical numbers were the most exciting things I had ever seen. I wanted singing lessons. I wanted dancing lessons. And when I grew up, I knew that that was exactly what I wanted to do. I also learned why only big studios made big musicals. Because they had everything under one roof. The talent, the sets. The props, the costumes, the lights, and most importantly, a big empty stage. Somebody to think it up, somebody to say, okay, let's do it. And a team to make it all work. If it's going to wind up on Broadway, the artist is called the set designer. If it's for a film, he's the art director. But since this is television, this is the hand of the production designer. And then the craftsmen take over. The wood is pulled and cut and assembled and nailed and painted and lit and decorated. And it's the same thing in the wardrobe department. A little quieter, perhaps, but just as full of craft and technical artistry. And the interpretation of the music. Getting the sounds out of the musical director's head and distributed among the artists who will reproduce them. And then the exhilarating, tiring work of rehearsal, the repetition of the steps and moves that flow from the choreographer's mind and feet into the rehearsed second nature of the performers. And finally, a legion of behind-the-camera professionals join the team. Director, cameramen, sound men and grips, makeup artists, hairdressers, and many, many more all must unite in one final, ultimate team effort, and suddenly, it all comes together.
I got my first job as an actor back in 1932 on Broadway. And although it was right at the rock bottom of the Depression, the show business there was very, very good. And then I got a contract with MGM and came out to Hollywood. And I was loaned out for a couple of pictures, Frank Capra pictures. Uh, Frank said, I, I have an idea for a picture. It's called, It's a Wonderful Life. It's about this fellow that was going to commit suicide, and, and uh, an angel named Clarence, uh, who hadn't won his wings yet, he came down and uh, he, he saved him. I knew if I were drowning, you tried to save me. You see, you did. And that's how I saved you. Uh, uh, very funny. Well, who are you then? Clarence Oddbody, AS2. Oddbody. AS2, what, what, what's that, AS2? Angel, second class. It, I, it's just been almost a part of my life uh, for all these years. And for this reason, this is my favorite film. It's a wonderful life. Thanks, John, for pulling me out of the cement back there at the Chinese theater. Well, I wish I hadn't pulled so hard. Where did you finally land, anyway? Use the street. I think it was called Dopey Drive, but I'll, I'll be fine. Listen, uh, it's only a short while before the official grand opening, so I gotta go do a final check. All right, see you later. Just a little lower back pain. Uh, I'm okay. All of the magic of storytelling lives here in this building, the Disney Animation Department. It's been designed to showcase the fascinating process of creating the animated films for which Disney is famous. More than 60 years ago, Mickey Mouse came to life on Walt Disney's drawing board, and since then, 
Disney and his animators have been the great innovators in the art and science of animation. But it still begins with a story, a soundtrack, and tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands, of individually hand-drawn pictures. Here in this area, visitors to the park can watch the animation artists at work, and they're a dedicated lot. What gets me excited about animation really is the fact that you can, uh, you know, sit down at a table and uh, with just a pencil and a piece of paper make something come to life. Take your pardon. The more and more that you can become that character, the more you feel like that character, the better your animation will be. An animator is an actor. He, he gets a scene, he has to act it out on paper. The animator's rough drawings are then tested on videotape, cleaned up, and passed along to be photocopied on clear plastic sheets called cells. Meanwhile, the layout artists are creating the sets and the background artists are painting them. Walt Disney used 410 colors to do Sleeping Beauty. In choosing his colors, the background artist establishes the mood of the scene. <laughs> Here in the ink and paint area, the individual cells are obviously inked and painted. Everything here has to be perfect because the next step is the camera department where the finished cells are laid over the background and then photographed frame by frame. Now, when the film is run at normal speed, the characters move and seem to come alive. The special magic of Disney's animation, however, comes not from the process, but from the Disney artists who use it. It's they who chart the range of human emotions and infuse personality into cartoon animals and even inanimate objects. You have to breathe the life into it. I think it's got to come out of the heart more than anything else. It's got to come from the heart, through your arm, into your hand, and onto the paper. Oh, that's very, very cool. It's really creating characters that you can uh, believe in and you can, you know, laugh with and cry for and love. So, my friends, now you know some of the secrets behind the magic of Disney animation. Technical, artistic, and emotional. Like all great art, it has and will endure because of its unique power to reflect and illuminate the human spirit. Hello, my name is Stephanie Powers. It's a very interesting question. What was the film in your entire life that left the greatest impression? And uh, for me, I, I have to go back to my childhood, and I must say that it was Bambi. Walt Disney never seemed to disappoint me in my childhood, but Bambi, that was extra special. But through that film, I learned a great deal about the dignity of animals, and a bit about man's inhumanity to those lovely creatures with whom we share this extremely fragile planet.
It's a shame that we haven't made a better life for Bambi and his mother. But perhaps we might. If we keep trying, we might get it right one day. If not in this generation, perhaps in the next. Thank you, Bambi. You certainly made me a better person. It's just a little while until we swing open the gates on this, the newest attraction at Walt Disney World. And I thought I'd check out my favorite place to be at a movie studio. It's a fascinating area that we call the back lot. This is where there's even more movie magic. For example, this. Now this could be an ordinary house on an ordinary street anywhere in the USA. But it turns into something special when the stars come out. Stars like Estelle Getty and Rue McClanahan from the Golden Girls. Hi there, John. Hi. Hello. Whoa! <laughs> I'm out of bath, Herbie! Ha! Ah, sit still, Herbie! How come I can't get my car to do that? And why shouldn't Mickey and Goofy live here? The rent is reasonable, and they're very close to work. These are houses for all seasons. Summer turns to winter just by removing the flowers on the front lawn and adding a heavy snowfall. Well, adding snow flurries anyway. But the most interesting thing about all these houses is that they're just shells. You see, you walk through the front door and there's nothing... <sighs> Excuse me, I'm very sorry. Up here is more of the back lot. All those great gangster movies of the 30s left us the pawn shops and the diners of New York's Lower East Side and the brownstone stoops of Manhattan's West Side, right over there. King Kong has left us the Empire State Building and 42nd Street left us the Chrysler Building right next door. Crocodile Dundee gifted us with the front entrance of that splendid hotel. You never know what you're gonna see around the next corner. All right, I'll get him. I'll get him right here. Yeah, the dancers are on their opening marks. Hey, Buster, we're ready for you on the set now. Oh, good. Good. This is gonna be great. It looks great, man. Hey, watch it, kid. <laughs> okay, where do I go? Uh, right at the top of the stairs. All right, right here. Opening position. All right, stand by, everybody. Opening positions. This is all right here. Okay, New York Street production number with Buster Point, Dexter and George Irving. Scene one, take one. New York, New York, a heck of a town. The Bronx is up, but the battery's down. The people ride in a hole in the ground. New York, New York, it's a heck of a town. Don't you know that it's rude? Oh, to keep my tulips waiting when I'm in the mood. In the mood, yeah, yeah. That's 
what she told me. In the mood, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when she told me. In the, in the mood, mood, yeah, yeah. My heart was skipping. It didn't take me long to say I'm in the mood. Okay, here's your opening positions there. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay, let's give it a shot. Okay, New York Street production number, 8th Avenue, Ashford and Simpson, scene two, take one. Oh, feel the heat. New York production number and Miller, 42nd Street, scene three, take one.
and a parade of stars when we return with the grand opening spectacular. I not only saw my first movie before most of our audience's grandparents were born, but I first appeared on television in 1933, six years before anyone had a television in their home. The occasion was the Chicago World's Fair, and one of the attractions featured a huge black box on one side of the stage and a very, very small screen on the other. The big black box took one's picture and there, miracle of miracles, the picture appeared simultaneously on that little screen across the stage. Well, I, I panicked my companions by doing an imitation of an act we'd just seen, a man who actually played two clarinets at once. Fortunately, I, I did not imitate another act we had just seen that made an even greater and more lasting impression on me, by the way. Sally Rand, the fan dancer. A few years later, on April 30th, 1939, exactly 50 years ago today, the first commercially transmitted TV program was broadcast. Few people saw it, of course. Most Americans only heard about it, sitting in front of their family radios. The TV broadcast was of the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, speaking from the World's Fair in New York. The theme of the 1939 fair was the world of tomorrow. And certainly, television has had an enormous impact on all of our tomorrows. We've rejoiced together and grieved together. We've taken our TV cameras to the moon, and we've seen our little planet from afar. And that's given us a new understanding of the need to protect our spaceship Earth and to make life better for all of its inhabitants. So, TV, here's looking at you. Happy 50th birthday. Thank you, Walter. And that's the way it is. April 30th, 1989, and you are there. Is everyone at a station? Are we ready for the grand opening? Kate? John? All set, John. On with the show. Rue, Estelle. The welcome mat's laid out. Wipe your feet. Harry! All systems go, John. Dick and the Creole sisters. We have liftoff, John. Everything's in? OK. Tony Randall. My area and I are prepared beyond belief. Okay, I guess we're as ready as we'll ever be. Let's get this show on the road. Magic person, it's all yours. Riding in the first car of the Parade of Stars are Bette Midler and Michael Eisner. Lauren McCall seems happy to be here with her children, Leslie and Steve Bogart and Sam Robards. Kevin Costner is here with his family too. The radiant Cicely Tyson is accompanied by Jack Valenti. 
Oscar winner Sissy Spacek is riding with her husband and young daughter. Leonard Nimoy and his wife. Mr. and Mrs. Rick Moranis. The lovely, charming Betty White. The director of Star Wars, George Lucas. The very elegant Audrey Hepburn. Harry Anderson riding with his wife. A car full of Musketeers joins the parade. That's Keisha Knight William in the middle there, the youngest star of the Cosby Show. And how better to end the parade of stars than the main mouse Mickey and Minnie in a lovely new dress. On behalf of the Walt Disney Company, I hereby declare the Disney MGM Studios theme park open. Let the magic begin. The Pointer Sisters sing, I'm so excited. You'll be too when you watch this.
and the final touch of authenticity for the front of the Chinese theater, Immortality in Cement. celebration will return with George Burns and Willie Nelson. Now back to the grand opening celebration. John Ritter speaking to you from the Earful Tower here at Walt Disney World where the opening ceremonies continue for the brand new Disney MGM Studios theme park. But before we continue there's something I've always wanted to do. Indulge me please. Fly! Fly! Dive! Yes! <laughs> Thank you. I've always wanted to do that. I need to get that out of my um, <clears throat> system. But we're going to momentarily leave the celebration to go over to our concert stage for performance by one of our younger entertainers. Please welcome George Burns. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, it's nice to be here. Nice to be here. It's nice to be anywhere. <laughs> and thank you for that standing ovation. But a kind of, but, <laughs> but it, uh, it kind of worries me. As a rule, an entertainer gets a standing ovation at the end of the show. You were afraid I wouldn't last that long, huh? <laughs> I'll be around a long... I gotta stick around. This is a brand new tuxedo. <laughs> I'm dressing right next door to the Pointer Sisters. <laughs> and there's a little hole in the wall, but... <laughs> I didn't plug it up, let the kids enjoy themselves. I've been to show business practically. Morty, help me with that store. Sure. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Right now, let me help you back to the piano. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yeah, I've been to show business practically all of my life. I've done everything. I played the front end of a horse, the back end of a horse. I did a roller skating act. I was a singer, a dancer, a monologist, a stray. You name it, and I tried it. Then at the age of 79, I became a dramatic actor. I did a movie, The Sunshine Boys, and I won an Academy Award. Thank you. And, and I found out the most important thing about acting is honesty. And if you can fake that, you got it made. Then at 81, I played God. I, um, I played him, thank you. I, I played him without makeup. <laughs> and at 92, I wrote a book, Gracie, a love story. Turned out to be a bestseller. Thank you. <laughs> Let me tell you about Gracie. Gracie played a dumb dame on the stage. The whole world thought she was dumb, but not Gracie. Gracie thought she was smart. When Gracie said these strange things and you didn't understand it, she felt sorry for you. Gracie never told a joke, she explained it to you. Like I came home one night, I said, what are we having for dinner? She's roast beef. I just put two, two roasts in the oven. I said, why two? She's why, because when the little one burns, that means the big one's done. <laughs> then I said, why did you put the pepper in the salt shaker and the salt in the pepper shaker? She said, I'll tell you why. Because you always get mixed up. And now when you do, you'll be right. <laughs> anyway, Gracie was special on the stage and very, very special. Now hold on to your seats. Here's my opening song. I've got to stand up to do this. Morty, will you take the stool? Here's a song written by Leslie Brickus and Anthony Newley, and it tells you just the way I feel. Okay, let's do it. Don't 
to realize we're living today. I'm happy to say, in the good old, bad old days, taking the breaks, making mistakes, the good old, bad old ways. Some people say they long for the old days, to take them way back when. But I'd rather stay right here with the gold days than go through that again. Seems to me you're either out or you're in. You lose and win in these sad old, glad old days. You're poor or you're rich, who knows which is which anyways. We're living on time, we're having to borrow. No one knows that we will live to see tomorrow. But nevertheless, I guess we gotta confess these are the good old, bad old days. Day by day you're either up or you're down, king or clown. Good old, bad old days. It's heaven or hell, hail or farewell, the good old, bad old days. I don't want to hurt myself. Don't you realize, come rain or come shine, they yours, the mine in these crazy mad old days. And if they play in my key, I'll wait for the curtain to raise. I'll sing all my songs, put on my makeup, right until the day that I forget to wake up. I'm happy to say, I'm living today in these good old, these bad old, in these good old, bad old days. Thank you very much. You know, when I, when I first came out, I said, all you need is a great opening and a great closing. Well, you just heard my great opening, and now you're gonna hear my great closing. You've been a charming audience, and I had a wonderful time, and thank you very, very much. <laughs> While the pageantry continues at this fantastic celebration, let's go over to the Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular, where thousands of opening night well-wishers are enjoying a concert performance by an American legend, Mr. Willie Nelson. On the road again. I just can't wait to get on the road again. The life I love is making music with my friends. Way to get on the road again. On the road again. Going places that I've never been. Seeing things that I may never see again. I can't wait to get on the road again. On the road again. I can land the ship and we go down the highway. Maybe I didn't love 
should have If I made you feel second best Girl, I'm sorry I was blind But you were always on my mind You were always on my mind All those lonely, lonely times I guess I never told you And I'm so happy that you're mine Little things I should have said and done I just never took the time You were always on my mind You were always on my mind Tell me Tell me that your sweet love hasn't died And you chance to keep you satisfied I'll keep you satisfied never took the time but you were always on my mind you were always on my mind you were always on my mind you were always on the opening of Disneyland. October 1st, 1971, the opening of Walt Disney World. October 1st, 1982, the opening of Epcot Center. April 15th, 1983, Tokyo Disneyland. And tonight, April 30th, 1989, the Disney MGM Studios theme park. Hooray for Hollywood! Terrific if you're even good. We're 
Well, we've done it. We've officially opened the Disney MGM Studios theme park. And even though we're saying goodbye, the business of making shows continues down there in the studios and on the drafting desks of the animators. You see, because of you, show business never, ever stops. The magic of movies and television continues. So it's not goodbye. Just until next time. Good night. See you soon. So long. Be good. Au revoir. Good evening. Pleasant dreams, everybody. See you at the movies. Good night, everybody. Amid our celebration, we pause to remember a star among stars. Lucille Ball taught the world that to be in love with Lucy was to be in love with life itself. We will miss her. Next, three majors of Lindsay Wagner's star in the Bionic Showdown. At Monday night, hold on to your aliens. The Richter scale hit an all-time high, and out shaking and quaking when he experiences his first earthquake. How come these things never happen on Melmac? Then TV or not TV, that is the question. There's mischief and mayhem on the NBC comedy Nearly Departed, Monday.
This is Epcot Center. Epcot Center at Walt Disney World in Florida.